Michael. Uh, hello and a very warm welcome to the session on production loans. And uh, you know, uh, the topic says it's seasonal production farm loans, financing the cash flows and not the cow. Uh, it reminds me of, a, uh, of uh, somebody who once said that uh, as for butter versus margarine, I trust cows more than chemists. Um, and here we are, uh, of course, ignoring the poor cows and focusing on the cash flow. <laughs> Jokes apart, uh, you know, these seasonal cash crops are as important for these cows as it is for the humans. Uh, as Michael mentioned that I work for HBL, uh, a bit on HBL. HBL is uh, the largest bank in Pakistan, largest commercial bank in Pakistan, with an outreach of 1,500 nationwide branches. Um, we have presence in 25 countries and um, an asset book of uh, more than $10 billion. Uh, the bank came into being in 1941, headquartered in Mumbai, now India, and uh, we shifted our headquarters to Karachi, Pakistan, back in 1947, uh, soon after the partition. Um, as it goes, 70s was the time of nationalization. The bank got nationalized in 1974, and then, uh, as it happened everywhere, it was privatized in 2004 after 29 years of inefficient government control. Uh, now, Post-privatization, it was the time for the management to actually think on the lines of revamping its various businesses, and rural banking being one of them to do it on a sustainable and a self-scalable self basis. Now, looking at the fact file of Pakistan, uh, it is evident that Pakistan is an agriculture-based economy with almost 24% of contribution uh, in the GDP from agriculture, more than 60% of the people living in the rural areas, and almost half of the labor force involved in agriculture. It is predominantly a two-season rural economy, just like uh, Turkey and Mexico, as we uh, were informed yesterday, and with an intensified focus on wheat, cotton, rice, maize, and sugarcane. And if we look at the numbers, not only that we are the sixth most populous country on the globe, we are the third largest exporter for rice. Pakistan is the fourth largest producer for cotton. Uh, it is the fifth largest producer for sugarcane. It is the third largest producer for milk. Uh, we are amongst the top 10 for wheat and maize. Now, you know, these crops contribute more than 70% to the crop GDP, these five crops. Uh, we'll go into the details of segmenting the agriculture GDP as well, but uh, before going into that, it is important to understand that there is, a, there is an enormous change in the GDP composition, in the agriculture GDP composition, whereby now it is no, more non-crop centric uh, than crops. For example, right now, the crop GDP of Pakistan is about 8%, and the non-crop segment, which is dairy and meat, is about 17%. Exactly two decades back, the equation was exactly the reverse of this. However, uh, keeping in view the subject of the presentation, we are going to focus on the seasonal crop production loans. Now, uh, it is also important to see that uh, despite this change, these crops remain very important and increasingly important, I would say, uh, due to f food autarky, uh, due to political reasons and uh, traditions. And of course, then there are some crops which are extremely important for the value added manufacturing industry, as well as they are a major contributor to the exports. Uh, while the production of these crops has facilitated and assisted Pakistan to avoid, uh, I would say, uh, caloric famine, uh, because of inflation, because of market uh, inefficiencies, this economic famine for these grains still remain a challenge and it results in urban poverty. 
Now, looking at the geography of Pakistan, uh, the country is almost growing all of its crops in the Indus Delta and uh, its adjoining command areas. Uh, I'm not too sure whether you are aware of this fact that Pakistan has got the largest contiguous canal irrigated system in the world. Uh, it is capable of watering about more than 16 million hectares of land. So uh, unlike many other rural-based economies, our, eco our rural economy is based on this uh, canal irrigated system, and uh, the rain-fed portion is quite insignificant in our case. Now, moving away from the agriculture landscape to the banking landscape, and specifically to the agriculture lending uh, scenario in Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, as we discussed uh, in the morning as well, uh, these, these banks are generally urban-centric. You know, it's easier for the banks to relate to the urban products. It's difficult for us banks to actually relate to fertilizer, seed, although, you know, we wake up in the morning, we eat eggs, we drink milk, we wear clothes. All of this is related to agriculture, but uh, as it goes, um, it's, again, the ba banking has generally remained mercantile and urban-centric. Now, uh, this has remained a challenge, and uh, we can foresee that uh, this will remain a challenge. Um, here, I would just want to share with you an interesting debate um, that took place at the Oxford Union about two and a half months back, and the motion states that uh, it is much easier for the camel to pass through the needle of an eye than for a banker to enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and you know, interestingly, this debate became extremely nail-biting. And at the end, you know, uh, it was the developmental bankers. It was the people who were associated with kind of rural banking and agri-finance that came as a savior and uh, helped the bankers to win that debate. So, and actually, I mentioned this to our chief executive as well, that you know, rural banking is important and we, we will remain the saviors. And of course, uh, post-2007, the era of inflation, as mentioned uh, in The Economist magazine uh, a few years back, uh, this is gradually gaining strategic importance for some of the organizations. I would not say all of them, but for some institutions, they realize that if they don't focus on this strategically important business, it becomes very difficult for them to go into the value added. Now, um, as you can see from the numbers, that HBL is uh, the market leader amongst the commercial banks in Pakistan with a market share of 35% in ag lending. Uh, these numbers pertain to May 2013. Um, now, it is important also to understand that uh, what exactly is the scenario there in terms of the participation by these banks? In total, there are about 26 banks, financial institutions, formal financial institutions that are engaged in agriculture lending. Um, one of them is a specialized agriculture bank run by the government. Then there are about four or five government-owned commercial banks. There are about four or five microfinance banks. And then the remaining are the commercial banks. Um, unfortunately, the interest from the commercial banks has remained very selective. Although they are there in agriculture, but uh, uh, I would say it's only a couple of banks which are actively engaged in agriculture lending. Now, uh, as today is a products day, uh, we narrow it down to what we are doing and uh, how we are doing it. Um, you know, uh, in this slide, you'll see that there are essentially three spaces. One is the conventional product-based lending, one is the value chain lending, and the third one is a tailor-made financing solution. There's a fourth one as well, which I haven't mentioned here. It is the wholesale finance that we give to the microfinance institutions, the rural support programs, and the microfinance banks. That is not seasonal as such, but the funds that are given to them are used for seasonal financing. Uh, it is also important to understand that uh, in Pakistan, agriculture credit is not mandated by the central bank. 
So uh, uh, it was till the year 2006, there was a compulsion on lending to agriculture. But post 2006, the banks are free to decide if they want to lend into agriculture or not. Now, on one hand, it is beneficial uh, for the banks to decide it by themselves. On the other, it remains a challenge for uh, the economy in general uh, to encourage these urban-centric commercial banks to invest into this strategically important sector. Uh, now, within these uh, three brackets of product-based lending, value chain financing, and tailor-made financing, uh, there are running finance loans, uh, essentially meant for working capital needs. Then there are bullet loans, which can be for a working capital need or a short-term loan. And then there are uh, investment loans or policy loans, which are slightly long-term. Um, now, when we, when we look at value chain financing, um, right now we are doing, as we say, a kind of a tight value chain financing uh, with uh, some of the bigger sugar mills, uh, where we are doing it purely based on the cash flow of the farmer. So in this case, we do not take any collateral from the farmer, and we take the risk on the balance sheet of the sugar mill. And it's the sugar mill that is doing the prospecting, the selection of clients, uh, and referring them to the bank. It is the bank which is doing the verification, which is uh, doing the field visit, and which is underwriting the credit. And then it is the bank which is responsible for any bad loans. Uh, so far, our experience with the sugar industry uh, has, has remained very positive. Um, and again, we have been very selective while we take the risk on the sugar mill because, you know, there are certain sugar mills which are notorious for not paying it to the farmers. But then you have to have a scoring system whereby you can rate a sugar mill if at all we would want to uh, finance the cane growers who are in that command area. Now, at the same time, we have certain loose value chain models whereby... Um, there are processors who, um, who actually uh, have an agreement with us whereby they take the supplies from the farmers and they pay directly to us, but uh, it is kind of, uh, uh, the risk is on the farmer. In this case, we do take a collateral um, from the farmer and uh, uh, as far as the processor is concerned, it remains important, but it is not as important as in the tight value chain model. Uh, when we talk about the tailor-made solutions, it is like one-off loans. Uh, here we have mentioned mango pulp extractor. Similarly, we have uh, done loans uh, or, uh, for, uh, for unique uh, or new initiatives, uh, such as uh, tunnel farming, such as floriculture, or uh, uh, animal gene improvement. So these are one-off loans which cannot, be, which cannot be covered under the value chain financing, which cannot be covered under traditional uh, or conventional product-based lending. Um, and this has to be done on a relationship basis, based on a feasibility, and based on a new idea. Now, you know, uh, as far as the conventional product uh, products are concerned, they are essentially targeted towards individual farmers, uh, whereby we give uh, crop loans to them, and uh, um, as we move forward in the presentation, we will also discuss some of the characteristics of those products. As far as the uh, product dynamics are concerned, uh, the major source of feedback is our field, uh, the front-end field officers who are our eyes and ears in this case. Uh, then there's a the feedback that comes in from um, our risk management. Then uh, there's a... There's a periodic mystery shopping uh, with the customers and in the branches that we receive feedback from. And then uh, we also conduct periodic um, independent researches from the research companies so as to really understand uh, how are we moving on a specific product. And then, of course, these are the internal factors. Then we have external factors of how are things uh, going as far as the environment is concerned. 
For example, uh, Pakistan faced the uh, worst of its floods in 2010. And then we realized that uh, there is an area which is, uh, we call it Kacheka area, uh, which is the land which is very close to the rivers. And uh, there was a lot of flooding in that area, although that land is very fertile. But uh, we decided that we should be cautious and conservative while lending into that area. So these are the kind of the external factors, or for that matter, if uh, there is a price volatility in uh, one crop, uh, then again, we uh, define our concentration limits accordingly. And then of course, there is an annual review apart from the ongoing review, and we, the changes are uh, made. Um, now, if you look at the segmentation, um, the structure is such that in Pakistan, there are about 8 million farmers, 8 million farm households, and 90% of them are subsistence land holders. When I say subsistence, uh, for the clarification of definition, uh, in Pakistan we define anybody with less than five hectares as subsistence landholder. I'm defining this because probably maybe some other person would have a different definition in some other country or by some other regulator. Um, so it's only that 10 percent which is um, economic holding or above economic holding. As far as the case with HBL is concerned, pre-privatization, we were focusing on everybody and anybody because the concept was welfare, the concept was sales oriented, but post revamp, post privatization, our initial focus has been on the economic landholders and the above economic landholders. Uh, while saying this, we remain very cautious in avoiding the very large absentee landlords. Uh, I'm sure that people from South Asia would understand the term absentee landlords. These are the landlords who have big pieces of land and who have a lot of political influence. So uh, on one hand, we avoid the small ones who are extremely vulnerable. At the same time, we also avoid extremely large landholders uh, uh, whom we have seen that uh, the credit worthiness becomes a big question mark. Then of course, uh, we do not give loans to the new farmers or newly converted farmers. You know, there is a new breed of people who have, uh, who have resources, who have capital, and uh, not in the crops, but they have specifically come into livestock. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was talking to a farmer, to a livestock farmer, and uh, he actually is the largest livestock farmer in Pakistan with about uh, more than 10,000 cattle head. And he, he came out with a very simplistic but a very in, uh, you know, uh, relevant remark. He said, you know, to be a livestock farmer, you have to live with the animal. You have to befriend the animal. You cannot come, invest, and assume that because this uh, business is making money on the piece of paper, this will also make money uh, on the field as well. And uh, I think that comment is very close to my heart because we have seen so many new people coming in with investments uh, or even venture capitalists investing without actually understanding the real dynamics, the ground realities of the business. So um, our target remains experienced farmers who are economic holding and who are progressive in nature. As I mentioned that about uh, more than 80% of the farming is being done through canal irrigation. Um, in this way, we also um, avoid and uh, remain cautious in the rain-fed areas uh, where uh, there can be a high probability of not getting enough water to grow the crops. Now, somebody from the state or somebody with a welfare mindset could say that it's unfair not to target that market, but our view would remain that we have to be scalable, we have to be profitable, we have to be, uh, we have to remain affordable as well for, for the farmers. We don't say that we, uh, we charge extortionate markup rates from the farmers that a middleman charges in this part of the world. At the same time, the issue is not pricing. It is the availability of credit at the farm level. Uh, as we are discussing it, of course, post-privatization, our approach has been a financial services approach. It's not a poverty lending approach. And we completely discourage uh, a welfare uh, mechanism for these farmers. Yes, there are ways to mitigate risk, 
to target small holders, uh, but then we do it through a model, through a model whereby those risks are mitigated. There has to be enough returns to achieve scale. Um, there is a last point which is written here. Uh, it is thinking beyond farmers. And the second last point, which says thinking or thinking beyond lending. Um, you know, um, our experience so far has been that um, in the year 2004, I'll again revert back to that, uh, the bank asked a simple question, whether we would want to continue with the agriculture lending unit or we would want to discontinue this department. And the bank decided that we would want to continue. So we evolved from a small agriculture unit to a rural finance division. And of late, uh, a few months back, we have been converted into a full-fledged rural banking uh, division. Now what that means is that we have started looking at the relationships. We do not consider a farmer as a person who would only require finance. We look at him from a, from a much more holistic perspective that that farmer also needs deposit mobilization products because right now uh, that farmer is either saving in the form of a kettle or that farmer is putting the money under his pillow or that farmer is putting the money with his relatives with actually negative returns. So, and then this can be built up with bank assurance, with payment transfer, with so many uh, other things. And that also brings in a lot of synergy to the business because before deposit mobilization, my business was borrowing money from treasury. But post deposit mobilization, actually, uh, sometimes later, I'll be in a position to lend the, uh, the money that the rural banking uh, department uh, generate to other departments. And thinking beyond farmers, it is very important because you know rural is not farmers only. Rural is grain merchants, rural is fertilizer dealers, rural is seed dealers, rural is uh, people who are engaged in, uh, in basic activities, in uh, small stores, in retail outlets. And it is very important to tap these uh, specific rich areas of interest because uh, Michael made a very interesting point uh, uh, yesterday when he said many a times these farmers uh, need money not for agriculture but for many other activities. Maybe that person wants to uh, get married again, you know, <laughs> but that will have a negative score in one of the banks, <laughs> I realized yesterday. <laughs> or maybe uh, he would want to go to the, uh, to the court to, find uh, to fight against his brother. Uh, for that piece of land, uh, or maybe he would want to purchase a gun. You know, there are multiple things. And these are, these are ground realities that happen. So we as financial institutions need to understand the real needs of that farmer. Because if we try to monitor him so closely that he should only purchase fertilizer, he should only, you know, we did a pilot and we said, okay, you'll get a fertilizer from this company, the farmer, went to the fertilizer dealer, got that coupon discounted, got the money, and came out and purchased some consumable item. You know, we need to understand what are the real risks involved in agriculture. Um, I think we have discussed this because, of course, Kilara is sitting there, and she has reminded me of the time. Uh, so we have to remain on time. Uh, I think I can move on to some of this is an important slide. Uh, now. Um, of course, bullet finance is a single season financing whereby uh, the tenure can be a minimum of eight months and a maximum of 18 months. It is cash dispersed and it is valid for all new to bank accounts or existing customers. Uh, the markup and the principal is collected at the time of maturity. Uh, then we have uh, running finance lines. These running finance lines can be for, uh, uh, for a tenure of as low as eight months and they can be for a maximum of 36 months. Now, uh, I would want to explain this 36 month period. It's a short term facility, but it is 36 months. Now it is being done for 36 months so as to avoid a repeated documentation at the farmer level and to facilitate the farmer in ensuring that immediately after harvest, uh, the farmer does not have to come to the bank and deposit the money. Rather, the farmer can keep the harvest with, uh, with him or with her and uh, wait for the prices to stabilize. 
and then sell the produce and deposit. The, so this gives the flexibility to the farmer at what time the farmer would want to sell the product. And then of course there is a uh, there is a debit card facility that he can uh, use that on a point of sale terminal or an ATM and take the cash. Uh, we don't want to monitor the farmer uh, so closely. Uh, once we have done the credit analysis, we have to trust that farmer as well. Uh, and again, uh, the product specifications are, it is valid for the new to bank customers, it is valid for existing customers. Uh, one point that I would want to mention here that we have some negative professions in our list. When we give it to farmers, mostly our farmers are uh, also doing other things. For example, a farmer can be a lawyer, a farmer can be a journalist, so uh, nothing against lawyers, Michael, but uh, that's in our negative list. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, you know, these journalists and all these people, uh, it is not that we don't lend to them, they are uh, given loans as an exception. So we monitor them separately. Uh, this is also an important slide. Uh, so uh, we of course look at the credit risk by going to the site, by doing a cash flow analysis, and there is a central bureau of, invest, uh, of uh, um, uh, credit check whereby we get the details of the indebtedness of the farmer uh, from the formal sector and whether there are any defaults in that or write-offs in that. Um, uh, there is a risk of forged documents that is uh, mitigated by uh, pre-dispersal revenue record verification. It's very efficient, but it's manual. Um, then again, there's a, there can be a production risk due to calamities. And this we cover uh, through crop loan insurance. Um, I'll not go into the details. Uh, I think you've already been provided with the CDs and uh, there's a webinar by AgriFin on crop loan insurance, uh, which you can go through. Uh, there are market risks and there are moral hazards for that. Of course, uh, we train our people, the front end loan officers. There is a risk architecture that we follow and that helps us in uh, mitigating these risks. This is slightly a busier slide, but I'll just take a moment. Uh, it, all in all, it takes about four weeks uh, uh, for a farmer to get a loan um, from HBL. Once he enters into a branch or he's contacted uh, by our representative, till the time uh, the amount is dispersed into the account. So uh, this is available in the presentation with your notebooks. Um, now. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just, uh, we have also started a pilot with Zarai Banking. Okay, Zarai Banking is, the Urdu for Zarat is, is uh, my Turkish friend uh, Omar would understand that. They have a bank Zarat. Uh, Zarat is agriculture. So, uh, in many of, uh, of our communications, we use local languages because it becomes difficult to make them understand uh, the foreign terms. Uh, so, it helps us, not even national language, the local languages that we use with them. Um, so, this we have replicated to now four uh, mobile vans uh, working across. And similarly, we remain active in the exhibitions at the, because this is a product day, we remain very active there. Uh, we come up with the out of home activities. Uh, and uh, now, I think uh, this is also important, but before, uh, okay. We also are very active in radio uh, when it comes uh, the, uh, the sewing time. And finally, these are, I'll just spend two minutes. We have a credit loan application package for agriculture. It's very different from a credit package in corporate banking or commercial banking or consumer banking. It has got five distinct parts. Uh, one is the uh, check off list that is not available here. Now, you know, that check off list became important for us to include because uh, many a times the risk management used to come up with their own requirements of documents. Now to avoid that, we have streamlined and there, with every credit proposal, there is a standardized checkoff list. Pre-disbursement, pre-sanction, post-disbursement, post-sanction. So everybody is very clear on how to move on irrespective of it. Not only rural banking, but the risk architecture also knows what are the important documents and what should they take. Then there is a process management sheet which captures the turnaround time at each departmental level. Um, and then there's a basic borrower information which incorporates information like education, uh, land type, the occupation, uh, the address, phone numbers, the picture, so that the customer can be identified. And uh, uh, then we have a loan application to measure the cash flows 
uh, and those can be of two types. One can be a farm loan or the other can be a non-farm or a non-crop loan. Uh, this is available in the folder and uh, I would be more than uh, pleased to respond to any of your queries. Thank you very much.